Walking away from a problem isn't going to fix it. Palm substitution may have superficial marketing appeal, um, but it's, it's not fixing the problem. Um, it's possibly making it worse, or quite likely making it worse, depending on which other oil crop uh, you might consider to, to try and replace palm with. But, you know, fundamentally, we, we have to meet problems head on and fix them. And, and in our industry, we have a very good track record of policing ourselves and doing the right thing. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of Purposeful Beauty, What's Your Purpose? Today, we're talking about the story of Palm in personal care. Jolene was joined on the episode by our Vice President of Customer Alliances for Corporate Sustainability at Crota, Chris Sainer, who is our resident Palm expert. Chris has worked with Crota for over 40 years in several sales and marketing roles, engaging in all aspects of sustainability with our customers. He has seen firsthand the evolution of corporate social responsibility and sustainability reporting in consumer products industries and helped design the architecture around Crota's sustainability reporting, which began in 2007. Chris is a fervent supporter of certified sustainable palm oil in the chemical industry and has helped to develop physical CSPO supply chains in home and personal care. Although he's not only an expert when it comes to sustainable palm, he also writes and presents extensively on supply chain integrity, covering issues such as carbon footprint, bio-based raw materials, and traceability. In this episode, you'll hear Chris and Jolene discuss the fundamental issues with palm, learn how much the personal care industry relies on palm derivatives, and even answer the question of if we should ban or boycott palm oil altogether. And as always, we'll hear Chris talk about the purpose that drives him to advocate for a more sustainable chemical industry. We can't wait to hear what you think about the episode, so please remember to follow us on Spotify and SoundCloud for more. Now let's take it away with our latest episode of What's Your Purpose? So hello everyone, welcome to the Purposeful Beauty What's Your Purpose podcast hosted by Croda. My name is Jolene Maloney, I'm the Sustainability Marketing Manager for the beauty care team here at Croda and I'm super excited to say that today we will be taking a closer look at Palm. So this can be a somewhat controversial topic as I'm sure we've all seen the distressing images of rainforest destruction and endangered orangutans, yet Palm said to feature in over 50% of all supermarket products. So hopefully through today's conversation, we'll discover a little bit more about what's going on, why this is happening, and probably most importantly, how can we move forward for a more sustainable future, particularly within the personal care industry. So joining me today is our resident expert on Palm, Chris Sainer. Chris Sainer is the Vice President Customer Alliances for the Corporate Sustainability Team here at Croda. Chris has many years of experience in the personal care industry and has worked extensively on supply chain integrity. However, I'll hand over to Chris now to introduce himself properly. So hello, Chris. Mm, hello. Hi, Jolene. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, to have this discussion. Um, Yes, I have a role in sustainability in Croda. I worked in Croda for many years. Um, and if I have any qualification for um, joining you today and talking about the evolution of palm and palm derivatives in personal care, um, that qualification is based on the fact that I've been part of the journey that we've been on in Croda in supporting sustainable palm. Um, and understanding how palm has evolved as um, a vital ingredient um, or building block to produce ingredients for the personal care industry. Ah, thank you. I guess that leads on really nicely actually into my very first question and the very first question for our podcasts, which is what's your purpose? So by that, I guess we're talking about how have you advocated for greater sustainability? I think the, I think the best way to answer that, Jolene, is, is if we go back, I always say 20 years, but 20 plus years, 
Um, the often asked question from uh, customers in the personal care sector um, related to the origin of our ingredients. And if you go way back, the question was, um, is the ingredient that you're supplying to us, Croda, is it animal based or is it um, plant based, vegetable based, bio based? Um, and of course, the cosmetic industry was built on a lot of animal based raw materials going way back. And we can talk about that a little later in, in connect, talking about the evolution of palm. Um, so that was typically the question that was asked a very long time ago. But now the question is, the bio-based ingredient that you're supplying to us, where does it come from? Which plant species? Mm -hmm. uh, where does it come from geographically? Where does it come from within the region or the province of the country from which you source it, the raw material? Um, and please confirm that it makes no contribution to uh, deforestation, loss of biodiversity, and um, also give us some insights as to the uh, social accountability in the upstream supply chains that you use. So the level of detail that's required now in supporting the integrity of our ingredients um, is enormous. And, and quite rightly, everybody wants to know that the raw materials, the building blocks that we use to produce ingredients are sourced sustainably, at capturing um, uh, environmental, uh, climate, and social elements. Um, and that's really one of the major reasons that I, I moved in my career from um, being a very, very customer facing uh, commercial role in the personal care industry to one of sustainability because the amount of, in, the appetite for information um, and the necessity to be able to support our ingredients through a, a great deal of information is something that I saw as being valuable um, and happily I can say that in Croda uh, we don't know everything um, but we know a great deal about the integrity of our ingredients and I think the personal care industry now looks at supply chains from end to end. I like, I like um, little sound bites and the end to end integrity of supply chains is something that we certainly strive for. So. That's been my major purpose and a lot of my activity, certainly over the last 10 years or so. Fabulous, thank you. Well, um, you're definitely well qualified to be speaking on the on the topic of palms. So thank you for joining us. Um, and actually, that's probably um, what our next question should be, really. What What is palm in particular? Well, palm is um, uh, a tropical palm oil is a tropical oil it comes from the palm tree and the palm fruit um, uh, palm um, originated um, as a species in from africa um, although the majority of the world's palm is now grown in indonesia which is the number one country in the world uh, followed by malaysia around 85 percent of global palm production comes from those two countries in Southeast Asia. Um, but of course, it, it is a tropical oil or tropical crop, um, so it can be grown and is grown in other areas such as parts of South America um, and, and Africa. It's returned home, if you like, to Africa. So if we can expand on that, you know, the pop of the growth of the palm industry, um, I think we have to take, a, well, we, we talk about the growth of the palm industry, how it, where it's come from, um, and then perhaps how it fits into the personal care um, uh, consumer product industry. If you go way back, and I'm sure you can find statistics, if you go back to the 1980s and certainly into the 90s, palm was a relatively small oil crop. It has grown in um, its output uh, productivity, um, since then, and it now represents the largest um, oil crop. If you look at all of the, the oil crops that are grown in the world, <clears throat> so rapeseed, palm, soya, um, olive, coconut, there's a whole list of oil crops, some uh, tropical, some from temperate climates, such as rapeseed here in Europe. Um, 
the total production of oil crops is around 170 million tonnes a year. That's the total output of those crops, um, which coincidentally is about the same in volume terms, that enormous figure, 170 million tonnes, same as the world production of ethylene, and that's one petrochemical. Um, we shouldn't uh, deceive ourselves into thinking that um, the world of chemistry is necessarily a natural one. I'm happy to say that it is in quota, but <clears throat> we generally live in a fossil based chemical world. And, um, you know, one one petrochemical ethylene, which obviously goes downstream into plastics, polyethylene, um, happens to be the same as the world output of all of the oil crops put together. Oil crops are grown primarily for food. Um, Palm um, represents 40% of the 170 million tonnes, so it's the largest of the oil crops. Um, but most importantly, it represents less than 7% of the land use. So you've got a crop here which is approaching half of the world's output of oil crops, but it's occupying less than 7% of the land. Um, which is remarkable, really. That is an absolute manifestation of the efficiency of palm as the highest yielding um, oil crop. Uh, yeah. More than twice as efficient in terms of its productivity than the next, which is coconut, and 10 times more efficient than um, soya, for example. So th think, think of it like this. If you wanted to replace palm with something else, say you wanted to replace it with coconut, which you can't because it doesn't have the same um, uh, carbon profile, carbon chain length profile as coconut, you'd need twice as much land. If you wanted to replace it with soya, you'd need 10 times as much land. And that amount of land isn't available because 50% of, of, uh, of land in the world is given over to agriculture. So palm represents a very efficient oil crop, um, which maximizes the use of land um, and couldn't easily be replaced with something else. And so now, in, you know, we're talking about the production of over 70 million tons of palm oil, again, primarily grown for food. Um, and I think we have to, you know, if there are naysayers around or about palm, I think we really have to acknowledge that um, palm is feeding the world. Yeah, yeah, those, sorry, Joey, no, Joey. I was just going to say those are some incredible statistics. It kind of really puts into perspective why um, why we can't just dismiss palm oil, I guess. No, no, quite right. Um, how has it evolved in the personal care or the home and personal care industry? Um, going back to a comment I made earlier about animal based ingredients versus um, plant or bio based ingredients. Natural oils and fats are referred to as oleochemicals as opposed to petrochemicals. And um, the oleochemical industry, certainly in Europe and in North America, um, was not built on palm. It was built on tallow, um, you know, a byproduct of, of, uh, of the animal industry uh, or food industry with animals. Um, so we're in the 70s. Uh, before my time, I hasten to add, but the 1980s, um, a great deal of um, oleochemicals and personal care ingredients were based on tallow. Um, you know, glycerol esters, stearyl esters, cetyl esters, all of the products that we, we know and recognize today, surfactants, um, they were based on tallow. And clearly the industry has changed. We all recognize that. There's a, there, was, there's, there was a gradual move away from animal-based products. Um, Clearly, consumer acceptance of animal based products um, diminished. The trend was to and continues to be towards bio based. Um, then, of course, there was the BSE crisis, which uh, was awful. And uh, that really ended the use of tallow based or animal based products, primarily in, you know, in, in personal care, home and personal care. Animal based products are still produced, they're still used in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so Palm um, really stepped into the shoes of tallow. 
um, right. that's how it has evolved. Um, you know, I, I, I made the point a moment ago that palm is a tropical oil. It doesn't it isn't doesn't grow in Europe or North America. Um, and what makes palm so important is its versatility. For the chemists listening to us today, um, it captures every chain length from C8 to C18. So caprylic, capric, lauric, meristic, um, palmitic, steric, and oleic, all of those um, using the old nomenclature, uh, all of those uh, chain lengths are sit within palm kernel oil, C8 to C14, and palm oil, C16, C18. So you have every chain length that you require for the building blocks to produce ingredients um, within that range, right. which explains why it is so widely used in the personal care industry, um, because that those two raw materials, the palm kernel oil and the palm oil, deliver all of that, that, those carbon chain lengths to derivatize, take downstream to surfactants, emulsifiers, emollients. Okay, okay, fabulous. So bearing that in mind, um, what is the fundamental problem with palm? It's a big question. <laughs> uh, it is a big question. Um, <laughs> because it grows in tropical climates, uh, tropical regions, um, many tropical regions have uh, clearly tropical rainforest, some of which is a very high conservation forest. It's thousands of years old, possibly millions of years old. Um, and that the element of palm that captures most people's attention and exercises most people, and quite rightly, is deforestation, you know, clearing uh, rainforest. Um, and with that, the loss of biodiversity, the loss of animal life, uh, plant life, um, and there is also another double whammy in that the high conservation forest or a very old tropical rainforest sits on peat. Clearly, it's been a very long time. Um, and in clearing that forest, um, possibly burning awful malpractice, um, the, the, the peat uh, has been a, is a carbon sink, so it, it has CO2, it captures CO2. Um, but what then happens is that CO2 is released. So lots of biodiversity and um, uh, an adverse effect on climate change. So that's really the issue with palm. Um, I think we need to keep things in perspective. Uh, you know, nobody, nobody defends um, deforestation. We all strive, and I think we think with some degree of pride in our industry across the whole personal care industry, um, we're making a significant um, contribution to sustainable supply chains. But let's keep things in perspective here. Let's compare palm with soya. Um, there is um, five times as much land given over to uh, soya production. Um, I was looking at this the other day, actually. There's around 100 million hectares of soya bean plantations in the world producing around 50 million tonnes a year. That's five times greater than the land use for palm, which grows around 80 million tonnes. So there's five times as much land used to produce soya bean, but it's producing less than the total amount of palm. Um, and the thing we need to be aware of with soya bean is that soya isn't just grown in the middle of America, it's grown in parts of the world which are susceptible to deforestation, certainly parts of South America. Um, so that's another point to illustrate that moving away, and I'm sure we'll come to this, I'm sure you'll have questions on this, moving away from palm is the wrong thing to do. Supporting sustainable palm is the right thing to do. Okay, Fab. so what do we mean by, by sustainable palm? Um, how can we, you know, ensure that we're supporting no deforestation, for example? Mm. Mm. Um, so one thing I didn't mention, just going back a step, 
um, on um, palm and deforestation. There is an important element to palm production in that um, 40 percent of the world's palm is actually grown by smallholders. Um, so it's grown grown by small farmers and they have a defined acreage or hectares. I can't remember off the top of my head what that is. I think it's 10 or 20 hectares. Um, and small farmers clearly are um, small operations. It's not all big agribusiness plantations. Uh, and there is a very strong social side or social accountability attached to supporting uh, small farmers because Indonesia and Malaysia are, I wouldn't say they are developing, they, they are well developed as, as countries, um, but there's a very important source of income um, that must be taken account of with, uh, with, with palm production, particularly with the smallholder element. Um, supporting sustainable palm, um, I think it became aware, uh, uh, people became aware in the early 2000s, um, 2004, I think, um, was the beginnings of the RSPO, the Round Table on Sustainable Palm. Um, but there was some recognition of the environmental pressures that palm was bringing to bear um, in um, in, the, in, 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 in Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, and what the Round Table on Sustainable Palm has done, certainly did in the very beginning and has grown enormously in its importance, is uh, set out, um, uh, if you like, rules or good practice uh, associated with palm production. Um, and today, the RSPO, um, I can explain about certification in the chain of custody in a moment, but the principle behind the RSPO is that if you follow RSPO certification, um, then you are embracing the principles and criteria, which certainly are, include no deforestation, um, compliance with good agricultural practices, there are elements of social accountability and support for smallholders, um, the principle, uh, principles and criteria of RSPO membership and uh, subscribing to them can be seen on the RSPO site. I'm not going to spend the next hour reciting them in detail, but it represents good practice in all its forms. And it is continually reviewed and has been reviewed over the last, um, you know, since its inception. Uh, how does it work? Um, if you are processing, if you are buying palm oil, palm kernel oil or palm derivatives, you and you're taking them into your manufacturing site, then you obtain RSPO certification for your manufacturing location. Um, that involves engaging with a certification body and there's a list of certification bodies on the RSPO site who are qualified to, to do the, the audit uh, and provide that certification. Uh, I'll just mention where we are in Croda. Uh, we have 15 factories in the world that are RSPO supply chain certified. So have the mechanism to bring in palm derivatives, follow the traceability through our systems and maintain a chain of custody. And how does the certification work? RSPO certified palm oil, palm kernel oil enters the supply chain. Um, and throughout all the unit operations downstream, um, they are they follow through uh, RSPO certified manufacturing sites. So we're buying palm derived raw materials from RSPO certified suppliers in the same way that our customers are buying RSPO certified ingredients from We Croda as a RSPO certified company. So as a chain of custody, it's subject to audit. Uh, there are rules to be followed, and those rules are checked um, by auditors on an annual basis. Okay. Um, so it is a robust system. It is subject to continual improvement. There is a review now uh, going on at the moment within the RSPO <clears throat> to enhance, further enhance the robustness of the supply chain, so the mass balance supply chain. Mm -hmm. And um, I won't take credit for it, but I did propose that um, 
um, resolution at the last global RSPO roundtable meeting in December last year, or rather, I personally had the job to advocate for it, but it was the resolution was actually uh, tabled by a number of, of companies um, within a coalition of which we are a founder member called Action for Sustainable Derivatives. Um, just to finish on the RSPO certification, mm. there are there have been criticisms or criticisms. Um, it's probably too strong a word. Um, questioning whether the RSPO certification is 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 doing enough. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it is it is it firm enough and robust enough? Um, I think the answer to that is it is the most important or largest, most recognised certification scheme um, and it has been and continues to be a very important tool for our industry because in, in the personal care industry we are consuming a very a great number, wide range of palm derivatives mm -hmm. um, and downstream through our ingredients palm derivatives find their way into thousands and thousands of um, uh, personal care consumer products. Um, so it, it, it is a very, very, very important um, supply chain, chain of custody um, to give, you know, confirmation of uh, the sustainability credentials of, of ingredients. It's just making me think, actually, I'm not sure if you, um, well, I'll, I'll ask you anyway, just thinking about the RSPO kind of certified sustainable palm, versus non-certified palm what's mm -hmm. what are the proportions like is it still that the vast majority of palm that's available is not sustainable or um the uh, again on the rspo site you can see the figure it's it's it'd be on the home page the the total production or the percentage of palm production which is rspo certified i think around 19 percent okay of the global production um, you know, not all. This is a really interesting point. It leads to a really interesting point. Um, not all industries, not all countries, not all regions, and not all industries are so focused on the sustainability credentials of the supply chains that they use, um, or in this case, sustainable palm. Um, Europe, particularly, um, has dare I say lead, I think that would be a little bit ambitious to say lead, but the, the a, a very big part of the RSPO membership were, were, were European based companies. Again, that will be visible on the RSPO site. Mm -hmm. Europe uh, does have clearly a very keen eye on sustainability and that's that's coming through with impending legislation, which we can talk about a bit later, I guess. Um, but not all industries, not all countries have the same view of sustainability. Um, and the personal care industry um, clearly does, and I am qualified to say that because I've seen the evolution of sustainability reporting in the personal care industry over the last 20 years. And it's front and center for most major personal care consumer goods companies. Um, yeah. And they're doing some, you know, they have some remarkable um, ambitious targets. Um, so the personal care industry has clearly demonstrated leadership in the uh, palm, um, sustainable palm industry. Um, it, it has um, followed a little on the back of the food industry with palm oil. But the big difference with the personal care industry is that we don't use much palm oil or palm kernel oil. In fact, we use next to none. But what we do use are thousands of derivatives, downstream derivatives of palm oil and palm kernel oil. And the personal care industry has certainly led the way in the sustainability credentials of of derivatives. OK, fab, thank you. So it sounds then like it's almost that demand for sustainable palm from the different industries that's kind of driving the supply of it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, mean, I did a calculation a long time ago um, 
I tried to calculate the total volume of palm. If you're an RSPO member, one of the things that you're required to do, rightly, each year, is report on your progress in supporting sustainable palm. That's called an annual communication of progress report. You have, I think, two months in which to file it uh, in March, April or April, May each year. Um, I've just filed ours for 2021. So you're looking back at the previous calendar year. Um, and what you report there uh, is your total palm consumption mm. and a portion of your palm consumption, which is RSPO certified. Okay. When you do your calculations on palm consumption, everything is back calculated to the amount of parent oils you need to produce your derivatives. So it's all back calculated up to the palm oil or palm kernel oil required. And what I tried to calculate a few years ago um, using publicly available data was the total volume of palm oil, palm kernel oil used by the personal care industry. Um, and I calculated it's around 2% of the world's output. So our industry, personal care consumer products industry, ingredients and consumer products, is consuming around 2% of the world's palm output. It could be 3%, you know what I mean? It, 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 that, but that's the order of magnitude. It's small relative yeah. to food or um, uh, the oleochemical world or, or biofuels. So if you accept that the personal care industry only uses 2% of the world's palm output, it's tiny. Um, but there are some important elements to it. We have, as, a, as an industry, the whole personal care global industry has a huge reliance on palm. And we, as an industry, have been absolutely leading in supporting sustainable palm in a very complex supply chain with a lot of different derivatives. So I think the industry, is, as an industry, we can be proud of our achievement because we've really punched above our weight, you know? Yeah. We've punched above our absolute volume requirements and been influential in developing sustainable supply chains, which otherwise may not have materialised. Yeah, well, hopefully... So Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to say, I mean, many people question and criticise um, industry for not doing enough. But the personal care products industry, I think, can, can with some uh, legitimacy, um, say that, you know, we, we as an industry, not quota, we, we've done a good job in quota, I know that, but mm -hmm. we're only part of the picture. Uh, the industry as a whole um, has punched above its weight and and done good things, you know, ex ex exhibited leadership, um, which certain other industries do not do. I mean, there are some industries that don't care. The personal care products industry does care and is doing something about it. Yeah, I wonder why that is. Um, I mean, it's definitely a good thing. I hope that it... I can you know... tell you that, Julie, and I can tell you why it is, because... Ooh, we we sit in an industry with a high degree of transparency. Think about this. How many products do you buy? Or does anybody, any of our, uh, anybody listening buy yes. where you know what's in it? In a personal care product, you know exactly what's in it. You just look on the back of the pack and it tells you. In food, you generally know what's in it. You look on the packaging and it tells you the, the constituents. Um, there are lots of things that we buy where we don't know what's inside them. Um, and that the consumer appetite for understanding the integrity of ingredients clearly comes from the knowledge and the transparency that the industry provides. And there are, there are an increasing number of consumer product companies now who, if you visit their websites, and I know you've done this, um, you can search for ingredients and they will give you a, um, a summary of the ingredient, where it comes from, why it's used, the origins. Um, so we operate in an industry with a very high degree of transparency. That necessitates a, a level of sustainability and clearly integrity. Whereas some other industries, there isn't that degree of transparency. I'm not saying these companies don't operate with integrity. I'm not saying that at all, but it's not visible to us. So we don't yeah. know. Yeah, no, I see what you mean. You've really, um, the, the consumer really 
influences the the personal care market with you know what they're looking for so like you say when you can see the ingredients on the back of a pack when you look at that inky list when you can look for on pack labels i've seen i started seeing rspo labels on pack mm -hmm. more as well yeah for example so it's a very good point that you make um and in fact actually whilst we're speaking about palm ingredients within personal care products what what do you think it is like why do you think that we have so many of these palm derivatives within these formulations and product launches well going going back to the the point earlier on about you know, for, 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 the, for the chemists listening um, yeah. there's the versatility of versatility. palm the absolutely comprehensive um carbon chain lengths that palm delivers you know c8 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Um, there is no other oil or oil crop that delivers that spectrum of uh, carbon chain length. And those chain lengths, whether they are uh, produced as fatty acids or fatty alcohols, clearly in different combinations, give rise to a, an enormous range of personal care ingredients. Um, so fundamentally, you think of uh, emulsifiers, emollients, surfactants, many, many, many of which are based on those chain lengths coming from palm kernel oil or palm oil. Uh, and we did a, a piece of work uh, quite a long time ago in Croda. What I wanted to know was how, how many ingredients are based on palm. I mean, we have our inky nomenclature in the industry. Mm -hmm. The combination of uh, Latin names and chemical names, and they're all defined in the Inky Dictionary. Um, and we, we worked out there are 21,000 monographs in the Inky Dictionary. <clears throat> That's um, 68,000 trade and technical names cross-referenced from uh, 3,000 suppliers in 100 countries. So if you don't like complexity, the personal care industry <laughs> is not for you. Um, the what we did calculate was of those twenty one thousand monographs, that palette of ingredients that we have, only about a thousand of them are palm based. But those thousands are only five percent of the absolute number of ingredients that we have are palm based. Okay. But those thousand ingredients happen to be the building blocks. They are the surfactants, the emulsifiers, the emollients. They are the larger volume ingredients that hold formulations together. Um, so palm-based ingredients, when you look at an inky list, which is always in descending order of volume, um, mm. they tend to feature quite quite early on in the in the list, and that also explains why palm derivatives are found in around 70% of the world's personal care consumer goods um, because many of those consumer products rely on surfactants, emulsifiers and emollients. Um, and so they're you know, almost ubiquitous in, the, in, our, in our industry, uh, which is why our industry as a whole has embraced sustainable palm, pursued it um, and shown leadership um, in the integrity of our supply chains. Okay, so um, talking again about the sustainability of palm, um, the personal care industry in particular, well, I think all industries actually right now is probably fair to say we're all working towards becoming much more sustainable um, yeah. and looking at ways of reducing, you know, carbon emissions, for example. So in that case, would you say that there is a link perhaps between the use of sustainable palm compared to non-sustainable palm and carbon reduction. Definitely. The RSPO began really with a focus on um, reducing or eliminating deforestation and loss of biodiversity. Um, what's now understood is that following RSPO principles and criteria, um, uh, there is also a significant reduction in greenhouse gas uh, potential or greenhouse gas production. Uh, in 2018, there was a life cycle analysis um, study published 
which demonstrate and there were there were quite a number of them you can find on on the web, but this particular one gained uh, a significant amount of recognition, demonstrating that RSPO certified palm oil production demonstrated, I think it was 35% lower global warming potential than non RSPO certified. But if you think about that, it makes complete sense. RSPO certification requires um, no deforestation. And clearly the deforestation element associated with palm and malpractice in the palm industry, um, clearing of forest and releasing carbon from peatland, if that were the worst case, um, or in the worst case, clearly um, gives rise to global warming. So there is now this, this important recognition that RSPO delivers a lower carbon footprint, uh, which can be calculated. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you. The, the part, the, there's another point here. The palm industry uh, is also doing a lot to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, for example, when palm oil mills, um, there is effluent or water coming out of the, the palm um, process. And that water goes into lagoons. Um, it's called palm oil mill effluent, P-O-M-E. And the bio-based com composition within those lagoons generates um, uh, um, biogas or methane. And quite a number of palm mills now cover over these lagoons, capture the methane to use as a fuel um, to run the plant. Okay. So there's, a lot of, there's a lot of good practice in the palm industry. Um, that doesn't necessarily um meet with you know the get the uh, consumer's attention but for those of us who have some sort of um yeah. connection up with the upstream supply chain uh, isn't it it's a very important development definitely that's super interesting i hadn't heard about that before but it's um it goes to show that sustainability there's so many different angles to look at it from like so when we're talking about palm and like you just mentioned the way that it's processed and the capturing of that and use of that methane but earlier on as well you mentioned um the farmers themselves and their livelihoods i'm, I'm assuming that rspo also helps towards that side yes, of things yes, the there, ethics. Is, there are connections clearly connections and support for smallholders um, and smallholders are, are, are important. You're, you're talking about people who have on relatively low income um, yeah. and that income stream is very important for their welfare, education um, yeah. and living lives as we all, all aspire to. Um, so there is a very strong social element to, to Palm as well. So yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so I think, I think by now we all know the answer to this question but I'm going to ask you anyway should we ban or boycott palm oil in any you know under any circumstances oh the, 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 the answer to that is no um and how can I best illustrate this all of the NGOs the non-governmental organizations uh, certainly all of the environmental ones have a position on palm so WWF, for example, with the panda, um, not that the panda is in any way connected with palm, but you know what I mean. So <laughs> let's choose WWF as an example. And WWF is, I think, the oldest NGO and clearly very widely known and widely respected. Um, I think WWF began life in 19, early 1960s. So they've been around a very long time when the environmental agenda or in the environment wasn't on everybody's agenda. But it certainly was with the with WWF and um, WWF's position, which is shared by many other NGOs, is do not even think of boycotting palm, moving away from palm. It's the wrong thing to do because of the efficiency of palm relative to other oil crops. Um, you would simply, if you chose to try and replace it with something else, you would simply be making the issue a lot worse because you'd be moving to most likely another tropical oil crop um, which was far less efficient required far more land and would then most likely contribute to greater level of deforestation go back to my point about soya 
there's five times as much land given to soya production. Yet, do, do does everybody talk about soya in the way they talk about palm? Um, no, they don't. The fact that most soya is used for animal feed is perhaps the reason. Um, you know, yeah. it tends not to touch the personal care product industry. Um, or if it does, it's a very, fairly light touch. Um, so, you know, don't take my word for it. Go and research it with WWF, but the answer is no. Any move away from palm uh, or any attempt to move away from palm represents superficial marketing reasons. Just in trying to get it off the label, for example. Um, yeah. Which which does nothing for the environment um, and certainly doesn't attract the support of such organisations as WWF and sure. many, many others. I, I, I would just add mm. that as an industry, we are doing a lot collectively yeah. as an industry and demonstrating leadership and punching above our weight, having influence beyond our supply chains. Um, but there is legislation coming and we shouldn't be surprised at this. You know, many of us, many of us in our industry are doing the right thing and striving to do more. Um, but when legislators think not enough is being done, which is perhaps true in some other industries, then legislation comes our way. And there is legislation in the pipeline, both in the UK with the Environment Bill um, requiring um, legality, uh, due diligence, and likely due diligence, difficult to say, likely due diligence and legality of commodities in supply chains. And in the EU, uh, there is some more granular due diligence legislation going through consultation and certainly likely enactment next year in, in 2023, um, requiring that companies importing palm derivatives, coconut derivatives, soya, uh, coffee, you know, a wide range of commodities, of which palm is just one, um, ensure that, 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 that sourcing of the palm oil, for example, is not contributing to deforestation. And due diligence means exactly what it says. You have to know, or you have to do the check or checks to determine that there is no contribution to deforestation. So as an industry, we've done a lot um, and we're continuing on our journey, but legislation is coming our way. Um, happily, because of all the work that we've done over the last 10 years, really, um, you know, we're, we are ready, relatively speaking, for legislation, um, whereas some other industries um, will not be as well prepared. Uh, well, yeah, hopefully this legisla legislation, sorry, will, you know, really drive forward this, you know, sustainable palm oil for for the wider industries. And, exactly. and going back to your point as well on, you know, why we shouldn't ban or boycott palm oil. I just wanted to add as well that I wonder if to some degree it comes a little bit down to education. I feel like in some cases I've seen people maybe more on a kind of a personal level rather than going up to a brand level but having their heart in the right place and thinking that if I cut out palm oil from the products that I use I will be helping save you know orangutans and save deforestation from happening mm -hmm. um, but actually it's because of probably a little bit of misinformation from the media that people potentially get the wrong end of the well, stick. Yeah, so. I mean, I, I've I've seen a lot of headlines over the years and I've seen an awful lot of information on the web. Um, uh, and, you know, it, it, attention grabbing headlines like palm oil as used in lipstick. Um, let's face it, for all of us who are involved in the industry and anybody listening who clearly has knowledge of lipstick, for example, <laughs> The amount of palm or palm derivative that goes into lipstick um, is very, very, very small. Um, 
if if we wanted to change the world, then I mean, I, I've said, and this is I'm not trying to discredit biofuels. I just don't. I have a particular view of biofuels. But if you're worried about deforestation, don't drive a diesel car with biofuel in it. You know, I, I, it's not. It's all. You've got to look at it in perspective. Yeah. Um. Don't take my word for it. Look at WWF's position. They are amongst, if not the most yeah. respected NGO, as I've said already. I mean, boycotting palm, um, one might consider that one is doing one's bit, um, you know, to 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 save save the planet, but it could possibly have the opposite effect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, so NGO, the NGOs say don't move away from palm, support sustainable palm. Walking away from a problem isn't going to fix it. Palm substitution may have superficial marketing appeal, um, but it's it's not fixing the problem. Um, it's possibly making it worse, or quite likely making it worse, depending on which other oil crop uh, you might consider to, to try and replace palm with. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, we, we have to meet problems head on and fix them. And, and in our industry, we have a very good track record, not just in Croda, but the industry industry wide. We have a very good track record of of policing ourselves and doing the right thing. Um, and the potential to move away from palm. Um, I mean, in today's world, because there are some awful things happening in the world today. Um, sunflower oil is not a substitution for palm oil. There are certain fractions that sunflower oil can deliver. For example, C18, oleic, for example, you get high oleic sunflower oil. Um, the world's largest producing country of sunflower is Ukraine. Um, and, you know, we none of us need reminding what awful things are happening in Ukraine. The second largest producing country in the world is Russia. So what do you think that does for the availability of that yeah. world commodity, sunflower oil? Um, and clearly all oils or many of them are interlinked, you know, substitution, not in not in the personal care industry because we have so many different derivatives. But in food, um, there, there has been a move away from palm to rapeseed. Um, in mayonnaise, for example, or margarine, you know, foodstuffs that we all recognize. There is some sense to that, if you like, in consuming rapeseed grown in Europe for something, a large volume product like margarine. Um, but in the personal care products industry, well, fu fundamentally, in terms of our absolute volumes, we don't move the needle. You know what I mean? We are so yeah, small yeah. as a, as a gro global industry with our absolute volume consumption, we just don't move the needle. But what we are doing is having a positive influence. Definitely. And, you know, we as an industry can be proud of that. And I do think from time to time, instead of being on the back foot and saying, oh, you know, trying to defend things, we should sometimes be a little bit more forthright and say, you yeah, know, we've done a lot as, a, as an industry. We've, if you want to see absolute leadership in sustainable palm, just look at some of the major consumer product companies and what they what they are doing, They're yeah. doing a huge amount. So, Chris, do you have any last thoughts on perhaps what brands and formulators can do when it comes to using more, you know, being more sustainable with Palm? And um, again, any anything for individual consumers? Well, I think we've 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 declared <laughs> our colours in, 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 so. in, in supporting and advocating for sustainable Palm. Um, Legislation is coming, so that will give consumers uh, an enhanced level of um, security, if you like, or, or com comfort in in um, in knowing that due diligence is being done in supply chains. We didn't mention our involvement with Action for Sustainable Derivatives. Um, three years ago, we joined a number of other companies, organizations, um, another group of other companies in forming a coalition called Action for Sustainable Derivatives, which is facilitated by uh, a Paris-based organization called Transitions. And 
BSR or Business for Social Responsibility. And our work in ASD, um, and there is a website for anybody who's interested, just uh, search Action for Sustainable Derivatives and you'll find the website and you can see the membership. And our work is in upstream transparency, advocacy and positive impact. So we are, if you like, um, we're almost industry specific. You know, we're, we're, the, the membership is focused on personal care ingredient suppliers and consumer goods companies. Uh, with the addition of pharma like GlaxoSmithKline, for example. Um, and those are our three pillars of work. Transparency upstream, ensuring um, uh, no deforestation and, and transparency back up to our, our, our mills and refineries, um, um, advocacy uh, for sustainable farm and, and positive impact. And positive impact involves um, we have a pooled funding model where we are contributing into a pooled fund along with a number of the other members um, to uh, for for uh, environmental work and social work, including reforestation. So there is an example of an industry or an, a, a group of companies getting together as a coalition to do more. Um, and there are other examples within the personal care products industry and that's again something that we as a as an industry as a whole can be proud of. Brilliant. But in answer to your question about, sorry, about what formulators can do, <laughs> um, well determine the integrity of your ingredients. Um, don't avoid palm-based ingredients because that's potentially the wrong thing to do whilst marketing some marketing groups in some companies may want that or request that that isn't doing the right thing necessarily for the environment. There are, be aware of what you wish for and the unintended consequences, you know, um, that could have an adverse effect. No, the, it's the integrity of the ingredients and the upstream supply chain. Ask your suppliers for confirmation of RSPO certification, the degree of transparency they have upstream, um, and be comfortable with the, you know, those suppliers who can give you that level of integrity. Fabulous. And maybe do you think it's a case again of explaining to the colleagues within your business that are requesting palm free, explaining to them why, so that they have that true understanding themselves as well? Um, yes, I mean, you just have to. That's why I always point to WWF, because yeah. I, I, you know, I've had so many discussions. No, I haven't had that many discussions, but the discussions that I've had, you always feel challenged and then people say, oh, Chris Sano or Crowda, they're, they're just <laughs> trying to support Palm because they're in it. Um, no, go go to an organisation that really has a global view and impartial. Um, yeah. So w, I don't think you can beat WWF on, on, on that point. Fab, thank you. Thank you for that. We'll, um, we'll, maybe we'll see if we can include a link or something to uh, to the relevant pages. We'll see what we can do. Oh yeah, there's some, there's some good stuff on the WWF website, really good stuff. Yeah, definitely. Fab. Oh, well, thank you very much, Chris. Is there anything else on the topic of Palm that we haven't covered that you think's worthwhile? I like making the point, and I think I've said it to you before, about the industry. As an industry, we're tiny, but in absolute terms, we've punched way above our weight. Yeah. Um, so is it the food industry that has that uses the greatest proportion of palm or is yeah, it these biofuels? No, no, no. 80% of the world's palm is food. The food. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's um it feeds the world. It's 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 and the, the majority of it is used in in you know cooking oils for example. Cooking oil. Okay. Or oh, a big part of it certainly in India and China. Um and then in you know the developed world with um uh pre-prepared foods there's a lot of palm derivatives go into you know all of the pre-packaged pre-prepared foods um, yeah processed processed that's the word i was looking for processed foods <laughs> yeah okay thank you it's, in, it's a really i find it a really fascinating topic actually i gen genuinely find it really interesting so thank you thank you very much you're welcome you're welcome